Hey everybody, it's Dave Hall here with the Gogi Fitness Systems and Mental Meatheads, uh, bringing you uh, another one of our Mental Meathead interviews uh, for the new year. Uh, I hope everybody had a good holiday. Um, in the cycle, this is probably the third interview of 2014, but it's actually the first one that I recorded this year. Um, which means you get to hear me cuss about uh, all the changes that Google Plus did over the holiday uh, to this format that I keep cussing, it seems like, every time I start an interview. But that put aside, on the line I have with us uh, Neil Hill. Uh, Neil Hill works alongside with uh, Ryan McDonald, who we interviewed last year. Uh, you guys are doing workshops in the south of Spain, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. We we um we uh, we are based just in a near a little village called Tarifa, um, and we have a, we have two places where we do our courses. These beautiful place, beautiful beautiful places up in the mountains, just just about ten miles from Africa. It's quite amazing, actually. Uh, we're blessed with gorgeous sunshine, beautiful mountains, beautiful lakes, waterfalls, tropical forests, beaches, everything. So what's uh, uh, I saw your post earlier today on Facebook uh, uh, from your breakfast juice. Uh, what's the weather like right now? What's what's the temperature uh, outside of Talifa? Um, well, right now it's dark. Um, it's just gone dark. Well, it's half past seven here. Um, but today I, w I was sitting talking to a friend, and it was it was actually too hot for jeans and and, and a shirt. Um, <laughs> And really, really, it was it was in the low twenties, which for you guys in America, that's what uh, mid seventies, something like that. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I actually uh, I pulled out my handy little Fahrenheit to Celsius uh, uh, calculator <laughs> specifically for this. Um, we're experienced. I'm in the deep south uh, of the United States uh, and, and Alabama, so it is. Uh, we're experiencing an unseasonably cold snap. Um, it's noon and it is 16 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which wow. I believe is negative eight Celsius somewhere around okay. there. So um, yeah, it's it's bust ass cold today. So uh, um, you enjoy your 70 degrees. <laughs> I'll keep quiet now. But no, I've seen this on the news. It's really amazing. It's like on the BBC News. It's like America is cold and it is the headline. <laughs> that's what it is. Snowing in America and everything else is wiped off the news. It's, it's that's that's really called amazing. a slow news day. We got nothing else. We got nothing to talk about. Let's talk about Possibly, how cold yeah. the Yanks are, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um so I saw um, I did a little digging around. I, I don't always do this, but uh, I was really looking forward to this interview. So I, I checked you out a little bit. Um, you do a lot of bushcraft type stuff, right? That's right. Yes. Talk to me about that. Tell me. Uh, uh, Tell you about bushcraft. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, the phrase was coined by uh, a Canadian man called Morse Kachansky. Um, back in the 70s, I think it was. And he was following in the footsteps of the old pioneers, the guys with the, the buckskin jackets with the frilly things and yeah. the coonskin hats and all that sort of stuff. And um, he, he took it to the level where um, he recognized that we live such metropolitan lifestyles nowadays, even if we live in the countryside. Mm -hmm. We live very urban, very... Um, safe, warm, protected lives, and we're kind of quite disconnected from from nature. And so he went back to these guys 100, 150 years ago, who were out there, the pioneers, who themselves were learning from the Native Americans about not about surviving in the wilderness, because that's what we do. Because Native Americans or Bushmen of the Kalahari or the Aborigines don't survive; they thrive. It's yeah. their home. It's their supermarket. The forest is is their Walmart or their Tesco's. You know, they they don't think, oh my God, you know, where's where's the next bit of food? They know where it is. Um, so he went back to this way of living and tried to turn it into a series of fun adventures. And he encapsulated it all in this phrase called called bushcraft. And then a guy in the UK who is a brilliant self publicist and very good on TV. He did a little, little ten-minute slots on a, on a bigger program um, back in the late 80s on the BBC, 
And the main program, nobody liked it, but everybody loved his little 10 minute slot. So he got his own series, which was called Bushcraft with Ray Mears. And then it took off. It became a really big thing. Wow, that's that's cool. Yeah, you've uh, uh, I'm grabbing uh, uh, paper for for notes because there there are several things that you've touched on that uh, uh, I think we're going to riff on. Um, the uh, uh, I don't even know where to start. My mind's working so fast on this. <laughs> there, one of the things that I have have taken away uh, from my own. Um, studies of movement and and our modern culture and and just you know where we are right now um, and, and I'm always drawn back to um, this concept that I might have stumbled across in an anthropology class or, or I don't know but it's one of those factoids that gets stuck in your brain that you hold on to and, and by God this is this is truth um, your average hunter-gatherer um, your Kalahari Bushmen the, the few that still survive spins an average of 20 hours a week working. Yeah. So shelter, food production, all basic needs are taken care of in 20 hours. And the rest of their time is leisure. Yes. And we live in a culture where, you know, we have, you know, all these newfangled, highly technological devices that are designed to save us time. <laughs> And we have all this time that's been saved up, right? And none of us have any of it. Yes. You know, my, I mean, my, just running a gym, my day has expanded to an average of 12 hours a day, you know, and I'm actively having to find ways to put the brakes on, you know, the things that I'm supposed to be doing uh, in order to, you know, find time to actually be and exist. Uh, because there's just this demand to do more, 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 and produce more, more, more. Um, so I, I'm very much uh, uh, intrigued and excited uh, by the concept of what you guys are doing. Um, and you know, Talifa sounds like an absolute, you know, Eden of a location for you guys to be set up. Um, tell me a little bit about your workshops. Tell me about you know what it is that you guys are doing. Um, and, and yeah, just start with that. Okay, well, um, Rannoch, who you've talked to, um, mm -hmm. he, he comes from a world that you kind of would be more familiar with. It's the world of inverted commas, fitness, movement, exercise, martial arts, boxing, lifting weights, that sort of stuff. Um, but Rannoch, like me, just loves doing all of that in nature. My, my main job happens to be in nature. That's what I do. I, I, I take people out into the wilderness and I teach them how to light fires, how to make shelters, find wild foods, find water, do animal tracking, navigate by the stars and all that sort of stuff. And so what our basic courses are about is combining the movement, which if we're talking about, let's say, let's go back to the Bushman. This is mm -hmm. a great example. Um, as you know, Dave, these these guys will do things like this this endurance hunting, which is where they don't sprint to try and kill an animal because they can't, because we can't do that. We haven't got the basic speed. But if we run for three days, which these guys do at a slow trot, then eventually the animal just gives up. It just stops. It's exhausted. They just run it literally into the ground. And... And that sense of movement, that sense of free movement just through nature is something that we don't do. We stick on a pair of almost high-heeled running shoes yep. and we go out with our green lycra and our bands on our arms and stuff. And I'm not decrying that because it's great. It's, it's not one-size-fits-all at all. It's just the stuff that I enjoy doing, the stuff that Rannick enjoys doing is a much more stripped-down version of that. It is the running. It is in nature. But it's kind of drawing on nature. It's drawing on, it's drawing on the. I can't think of a better word at the moment than energy, and that is such an overused word. Um, but there's something in there. When I'm running on the mountain, I will get into into an absolute rhythm. When I'm running on on a very rocky path, and I have to be completely focused that I don't turn my ankle because there are big sharp stones sticking up mm -hmm. everywhere. And I use these very minimal running shoes. They're called kind of like barefoot running mm -hmm. shoes. 
Um, and if you hit a stone, it really, really hurts. Okay? <laughs> so you're super focused where you are. You haven't got the white, the the um, the headphones in with some pumping electronica going on in your head. You're you're not thinking about. Oh my God, I haven't done the washing, and I should have done that, and I need to change the car tire. And, because if you do, you're going to hurt yourself. So you're completely yeah. focused on that run. You're you're also because of that very concentrated on the environment that, that you're in. You can start to smell. I'm going through a pine forest that's a little bit shadier. The temperature drops a degree or two. You've got the pine resin stuff coming through. And you're aware of all of that stuff. And then you're carrying on through. And what I found is that that that, that being in that moment allows me to draw on reserves of strength that I don't normally think I have. For example, you think, I don't want to run anymore. Because I'm kind of running up mountain straight up and it's tiring um, but because I'm actually really focused where I am in that moment I'm thinking well can I do another step and the answer is yes can I do another step and the answer is yes and then suddenly you start drawing on like this these little reserves of energy and and you're suddenly almost floating just 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 almost effortlessly moving through nature and you, you're conscious of all the environment around you and I guess in a sense, like the Bushmen would be when they're doing their endurance pursuit running of, of tracking down the prey. Um, and so it becomes a pleasure. It's not a workout. It's just it's just an interaction with nature. It's just being there. So that's just like a small thing. But, you know, Ranek will lead us through things like Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, he'll be talking about body weight training, how we can use items around us, just find, found items in nature really strict back stuff. I'll be coming at it more from the survival element, more from the nature element. But there's a story that weaves through the whole thing of 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 just of just how we use nature to help us to become more aware of what's around us, of of learning, of just listening, reading the book, reading the book that is nature that's right there in front of us. That's the sort of stuff we do. Wow. That's that's beautiful. <laughs> that's that's really cool. Um, I you know I am not much. Uh, well, I fall in and out of of uh, uh, of my running. Uh, uh, um, I can very easily find a reason not to run. Uh, but when I do run, um, it's always out in the woods. Uh, you yeah. know, I would I would favor a trail run over the street uh, any given day and. Uh, um, you know, I'd rather hit myself with a stick than to get on a treadmill. So. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's it is and for me. For some people, it's all they have, and that's great because any movement's better than no movement. Yeah, but, agreed. But the idea of standing on a machine, just pounding, looking at a series of dials, with some MTV or whatever in the background, just for me, it doesn't do it. No. But interestingly, I loved your point about the the leisure time before that we were promised yeah because I grew up and I remember writing essays my teacher say in English would set me an essay about you know what's the future gonna be like write a story on it so I would and everything I learned at that time was that by the time I was 30 40 50 I'd be wearing like a silver suit with my own personal <laughs> jetpack that's right and and I would have phenomenal amounts of leisure time because that's what people talked about that we'd be freed and kind of what's happened is the opposite, that they've enslaved Absolutely. these things. So we've got them everywhere. I've got this plugged into the computer. Yeah. I've got my computer there, and I can see things flashing at me. And it's like, you know, you've been away from us for 10 minutes talking to somebody else. Where are you? What are you doing? You know, it's, it's kind of scary stuff in a way. But the Bushmen, yeah, they have that, that, that time where they have a huge amount of time for song. And for dance, and for play, and for touch, and for social interaction, and for sleeping, and and in some ways, that's what we actually are, and that's kind of nice to see that. And there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff we could learn from that and from them. I think. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the interesting thing about about technology and time is is that we. We seem to find ways to quickly fill up, you know. And there was you know, the, the 
when this concept was presented to me, uh, this was probably 20 years ago, and uh, uh, and we didn't have half of what we have now. And so we're talking about you know just the introduction of a washing machine, and how you know that was supposed to free up all of the time that you spent doing laundry. Well, now that that actually the washing of your clothes takes a total of you know 15 minutes of of actual your participation. Um, yeah. Suddenly we're doing laundry every day. You know, yeah. whereas before it was, you know, once a week. This is going to take a couple hours to do. We're going to spend some time on this. We're just going to, you know, so you would wear your clothes several times, you know, yes. before you washed it because it was. But now, you know, it's like, oh, I wore that for three hours. It's dirty now. I got to go. You know, <laughs> yes. Yeah, throw yeah. it in laundry again. Our our, our priorities shift. Uh, in a way that that seems to rob us of the convenience, you know, being, you know, technologically tethered. Um, I'm 42, so you know, when I was a little kid, I grew up in the 70s, um, and so my my range as a child, where I would play, um, really consisted of of two complete neighborhoods. Two total subdivisions of of I don't know but at least a couple square miles. I was in, I was definitely you know at any given moment far enough away from my house that if my mom went out on the back porch and called me, I most likely wasn't going to hear. Yes. You know yes. I knew that I was supposed to be back for lunch and I was supposed to be back for dinner. And other than that, I was told to get the hell out of the house and go play. Yeah, um, exactly. My kids. You know, their range of play was the end of the block. Yeah, and that's probably quite good, actually, because I know. I mean, I used to live. Uh, I lived for five years in Brighton, in southern England, and it's a beautiful seaside town, and all the houses are very grand, Regency and Victorian ex mansions. I mean, absolutely yeah. beautiful. But now they're all flats because nobody can afford to live in this. <laughs> um, and but because they're all flats. There's no gardens for kids to play. So the children there, literally their interaction was to pick up their phone or their computer and say, hi, how are you doing? There was no meeting point. There's no, and and now there's this, this, this whole irrational fear of stranger danger, which of course, very rarely something terrible happens. Yes. It does. Yes. But actually, it's not at any more common than it was in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. It happens. It's wrong. But... But, but by locking kids in their bedrooms, you're creating a much bigger problem than they would be to go out and experience. I mean, one of the big things, I grew up about the same generation as you. I could never come in the house in the summer. I wanted to be out all the time. It's like, where are you? I was, And I was doing nothing more than playing soccer in the park or climbing trees or running through woods. I mean, nothing. I had my old bike, and I was so happy with my group of friends. Yeah. Um, to come in the house was a punishment. To stay in the house was a serious punishment. Um, and I could go, and I could like, I could, I can remember even at school we had a little pond, a little round pond, and I would spend hours lying on my stomach, gazing into that water at the life that was in there. For me, it was brilliant. My ex-partner, her children, I used to take them into school. They have a pond, but the pond now has a high fence around it. And the high fence has so many signs on saying, danger, do not go here. And it was all big red signs, danger, this is, this is, you know. Um, and then you walk in and it's like, do not run. No ball games. Danger. Um, stop here. Uh, there's an intercom that says adults must wait there. And it's like, you know, what is going on in these kids' mind when they see this fear being projected on them all the time? By us, adults, um, usually not in the name of looking after the kids, probably, but more in the name of not getting sued. Um, yeah, not getting, absolutely. You know, yeah, um, yeah. Now it has much more to do with you know, with suspending liability than uh, uh, than anything else, yes. and that's you know, that in itself is tragic. You know, it is that, that you're more concerned with you know. Yeah, potential liability than than the welfare of you know the children that you're actually tasked with with taking care of. Um, yes, yes. Although we're very lucky here because literally there, just there that way, is a beautiful mountain. And if I was ten again, that would be heaven. 
yeah. because it is full of caves and giant rocks and graves, 5,000 year old graves cut into oh the rocks God. in the shape of people where they used to leave the bodies to be eaten by the vultures, by the buzzards. Yeah. Um, and it's a joy. And uh, for me now, it's a joy. Uh, that's my playground. That's my gym. I just oh, go God. jumping from rock to rock and climbing yeah. the trees and running and falling and bruising and hurting myself. And and it's wonderful. And that's where we take the kids. The kids, that, that's that's our playground for the children. And I, I tell you, Dave, they... They, they get their phones and they come with their latest iPhone and, and when they arrive, they're like, by the time they've left, they've forgotten them. And it's not because yeah. we're doing anything clever, because we're not. All we're doing is creating a space where these kids come in and they rediscover that they're children. They forget their clothes. You know, I remember once I, I was doing a course with some teenagers and these, these 16, 17-year-old girls came. And as ever, you send out a list of... Of, of clothes to bring for their parents, yeah. okay? And one of the things was sensible outdoor clothing, waterproof, you know, shoes and things. And this one girl came with sheepskin boots, so waterproof boots, which are basically sponges on her feet. <laughs> and the mud was this deep. And, <laughs> the mud and she was so angry. And her outer layer was a pink towel with a rabbit on the back. And she got round the fire and she was like, man, she was just, ah. Oh, I don't want to be here. An hour later, she had a marshmallow on a stick and she was toasting it in front of the fire. Her boots were forgotten, you know, her fancy clothes were forgotten. And she was a 17-year-old again. She was no yeah. longer a, a, a woman. She was a 17-year-old having fun. And that's what I find with the kids here when we take them up. They, and adults too, you know, we can let our hair down and, and let's try to light a fire. You know, let's forget looking good or whatever, you know, and all the gear. Let's just let's just go out and have a laugh in nature. And, and ultimately that's what it's about. You know, we're not we're not serious. We're we're just creating fun and adventure for people, I guess. That's you know, that's that's a beautiful thing that you guys are doing up there. Um you were you're you're describing this and I guess my next question is is how did you get here how did you <laughs> how how did you get to the point because I mean this is you know on one hand it's a pretty risky proposition you can't tell me that you know when you were like hey mom and dad you know I want to teach people how to be wild in the south of Spain you know they were like um are you sure that's going to work out for you so what what was the process yeah. how did you, how did you end up wow. here? Um, I wish I could tell you a lovely romantic story <laughs> about I was abandoned at the age of three in the Amazon and I was brought up by the Kayapo and they taught me, no, I, I was brought up in Manchester, England, a big northern industrial city mm -hmm. of about five million people and um, I was as urban as they come but, I, but ever since being a little kid I loved nature, that's where I became alive. Um, I, I, kind of, I kind of got it. I got nature somehow. I, I understood the language. Um, and and at school, I was in a big school of about fifteen hundred children. And um, behind the school was was uh, uh, an old industrial area that had f had been removed and now had, was going back to wilderness. And in in my eyes as a kid, that was my Amazon. Even though now I look at it, it's very tame and kind of ugly, but in my, as a kid, that was my Amazon. Yeah. I used to go there, and I would spend hours and hours just being lost in, in, in nature. And when it came down to, to making a decision about a career, for some reason I decided, as every, like the middle of living in the middle of LA or New York or wherever, I want to be a farmer. No farming <laughs> roots whatsoever, no experience of farming. And the the careers teacher at school just said, "You've got to be kidding! You know what's, what's wrong with a factory? What's wrong with an architect? It do something, <laughs> but not a farmer." And I was adamant I wanted to be a farmer until I discovered that actually a lot of the farming systems were things that were damaging the thing that I loved. Yeah. And and I just came across a career path working in nature called wildlife conservation. So that's what I did. I went to university. I got degrees in, in biology and then a master's degree in, in, in ecology. And 
and I learned about nature from a very scientific point of view. I became a, uh, I guess in America, like a ranger kind of thing, but working for the state. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I loved it to the point where I realized that, that it still wasn't it still wasn't answering to me what nature is. For example, we'd go out with a group of people and and we'd talk in very scientific reductionist terms about the world that we were looking at. This is that community. This plant relates to that. But we were missing the whole. There's a wonderful book, if you probably remember, called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Burgess. Little, exactly, yeah. And there's a little section in it where he describes the way that a Westerner would view the desert. And he says a, a Western scientist would basically take all the grains of sand and start to categorize them. So say white grains, black grains, um, brown grains, and then it would be square grains, and then square medium grains, and then triangular grains. And eventually, over hundreds of years, the scientists would end up being surrounded by little piles of identical <laughs> sand particles. But that isn't the desert. The desert is that thing randomly thrown together. Yeah. And that's the way I got nature, not the reductionist way. And and again, when I was a kid, I remember I was reading a little sto kid storybook on on Australia. And I, it's amazing wildlife there, the kangaroos and the duckbill platypus and wallabies and like really weird animals. And it's like, wow, look at this, it's so cool. And the Great Barrier Reef, wow, man. And then they turned the page over, and there was an Aboriginal warrior standing, a, a drawing of a man on a page with a spear, standing on one leg, with the face paint. And, and I, it was just like, wow, that is so cool. And I read a little bit, just, as, just in, in a child's interpretation of this man. And I kind of understood more. I can't explain it now, but I understood more of the way that he was seeing the world than the world that I was being trained to participate in, to be an engineer with my silver suit, with my jetpack, and my mobile, and my et cetera, et cetera. Um, I kind of got, I somehow, and I'm not, I really am not being wise after the event. I remember just thinking, I love that. And it's something yeah. stuck in me, and I could never have articulated it as a child. You know, I just liked it. You know, like I like ice cream. I like chocolate. I like that. Um, and... And so after five, ten years in my job, I began to revisit the, 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 the First Nations way of looking at the Earth again, in a, in a, in a really trying to revisit it. And, and I realized that my job was basically saying, no, you can't build that here. You can't build that road here. You can't chop that forest down. You can't build that supermarket. And I was spending my life saying no and fighting. And I thought, there's got to be a better way of doing it. And, and I remembered, for me, the way was being really, really excited and turned on by nature. I mean, as excited as getting the latest iPad and a $10,000 or whatever. So excited. And I thought, well, if, if I can just maybe spread a bit of what, what I loved about nature, which is not teaching people about the science, but teaching people how to make a den, or light fire, or, or that tree, that tree there it has like a leaf you can you could eat, and the bark can cure a headache, and the wood is great for making fire by friction, or something, you know, then you're looking at that tree differently, and you're interacting with that tree, and then suddenly that tree is kind of a bit precious, and particularly if you can do that with children, because yeah. children are incredible, they're just amazing, and they'll start saying, you know what, this is my backyard, and, 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 and I don't want there to be a supermarket here. And they grow up with that, and they grow up cherishing and loving it. Now, I'm not saying I can do that, but that's what, I, that's what we try to do. This is, this is the whole rewilding proposition, if you like, of Earth Strength, is that we, we, I, we, Ranik and I both know, we've read about these wonderful scientists who've reintroduced rare animals back into the wild. And I've done it personally with the Iberian lynx here in, in, in Spain. Um, people reintroducing beautiful rare owls or eagles or leopards or whatever back into the wild. But the one thing we've forgotten to release back into the wild is ourselves. Yeah. So our proposition at Earth Strength, if you like, is rewilding humans. We want to reintroduce humans back into the wild. Into that, into that Bushman scenario of the 20 hours work 
the rest of it leisure. Now I'm not saying people are, are dropping what they're doing, but they're getting a new a new relationship to the world around them, seeing it with like new eyes, um, and and just having a blast doing it. That's, that's what it's about. I think that's wonderful. I, I you know personally, I've over the last you know it's it's since. I, like you, I've had always had an attraction for um, for the outdoors, for you know being. I'm a very physical person, so being physical in this world, I'm not satisfied to only have a, a, a cerebral interface. Um, yeah. I uh, uh, and so for me, that's taken that's sort of t shown its expression in. Uh, um, an appreciation for older craft uh, in terms of I have a wood burning stove that I heat the house with um, so I you know I take you know great pleasure in spending weekends finding you know down trees that have either been storm damaged or somebody else has paid to be cut down and cutting them up and splitting them for firewood um, you know, it, it, I could talk for hours about my favorite acts. Um, you know, just <laughs> that sort of thing yes. is really, you know, I get into it a lot. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm very heartened to hear that uh, you guys are doing so well with Earth Strength. Um, I've always had a, a, a project in the back of my mind. Uh, um, the working title for it was Man Hands. And it essentially was a... Uh, um, you know, a, a weekend retreat allowing uh, um, mainly adults, but people to get back out into uh, physical labor again, because so many of us have lost, you know, those basic hand skills that uh, um, you know our grandfathers and our and our great grandfathers take for granted. Um, so you know, my we talked earlier about uh, uh, your parents. There, uh, my grandfather is um, of your parents' generation. He is uh, uh, ninety. He's ninety-four. My grandmother just turned wow. ninety. Um, and so you know, he tells me stories of uh, um, of during the depression when the depression hit here in the United States. Um, his father owned a gas station, a Texaco station, and so frequently it was my grandfather's job um, to do farm work uh, while his dad was working the, ga the gas station. Um, so my grandfather at eight years old by himself managing a horse-drawn plow you know, yeah. and things like that, that I'm just astounded by. I'm like, yes. you know, I, the... Uh, um, the physicality of of that generation um, is something that I think the and previous generations surely um, that we've lost. I don't mean, I don't, you know I think you know on one hand we celebrate our sports figures and talk about how you know we're we're breaking records every year mm -hmm. and you know we're getting faster and 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 shaving times off of you know. Um, Olympic events and, and athletic events, whatever they are, um, but I think on the whole, as as humans, we're really, or at least as 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 modern Western humans, we're really atrophying. Yes. Um, my grandfather tells a story about having a detail in uh, World War II where they were loading uh, 55 gallon drums onto trucks um, of uh, drums of fuel. One day, uh, it was him and one other guy, and one day the other guy was, was sick, and he didn't come in that day. So my grandfather just did it by himself. Um, and at the end of the day, the commanding officer was like, well, damn, Harold, you're doing such a good job. Well, I'm just going to let you do this, and we'll put, you know, we'll put Pete over on something else. Um, yeah. You know, and the joke is my grandfather was like, just because I can doesn't mean I will. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which is a funny story, but then if you sit down and do the math, and I was like, wait a minute. You know, a gallon of water is about eight pounds. Mm -hmm. So a 55-gallon drum is over 400 pounds. So my grandfather was wrestling. I'm, I'm sure he, you know, it wasn't just pick it up and heave it and throw it on the truck. But still, yeah. the man was handling for, you know, at least an eight-hour day, 
you know, 400 pound barrels and was doing yeah. it at a capacity that his boss was pleased with his work output that was normally two guys doing work. Yeah. That's amazing. That's it, just is, it is totally amazing. I mean, I can tell a, a similar story of when I was when I was transitioning from working in this national park to doing what I'm doing now, I saw an advert in this in this magazine called Woodlots. It's all about trees and forestry. Mm -hmm. And most of the adverts are very glossy and very sort of modern and you know all and there's this one little sentence and it just said, um, Old Woodsman would like to teach technique if you're interested, phone me, Dave. And I thought, I'd like to learn about the woods and forestry. So I phoned this 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 number and this really grumpy old guy answered and he said, Oh yeah, come down and see me. Gave me the directions and I got to this beautiful, beautiful chestnut. Uh, wood that he has. This is done on the south coast of England, and um, and he was there like this sort of old goblin and uh, with a big <laughs> beard, smoking a pipe, and great big gnarled, twisted hands. About seventy years old, no teeth. Well, he had, I think he had two teeth. Um, and he was eating the cake, but just literally was eating the cake whole, and um, uh, and he just said, "What do you want to do?" And I just said, I want to learn about trees and things. And I started talking to him like you would almost if you were in like a job interview. And he yeah. said, stop, stop, stop that. He says, just tell me what you want to do. Don't sell yourself. What do, you, what do you want to do? And I said, and I just said, well, I want to learn about forestry and the old ways of doing it. He said, okay. So, I'm gonna, so he took me on basically as his apprentice. Um, oh, like he wow. would if you were 14. Yeah. In the old days. Now, he wouldn't let me touch anything. Yeah. Except to sharpen the tools, and if you let you sharpen the tools, stone. Yeah, that's it. You, your first job was to sharpen the tools to wow. to the chisels, the saws, uh, the chainsaw, and things. And it was what they used to teach the kids that, and that, and they did nothing but that for years until they were brilliant at it. And and if I got it wrong, he'd throw a rock at me or a piece of wood. <laughs> And um, <laughs> he was a he was a great guy. He was dying of cancer, um, and he'd had radiotherapy, and it basically he said it, it burnt him inside. He could feel the burning from the radiotherapy. Oh man! And they gave him a mound of drugs to take, and he was on opiates as well to take away the pain. And and they said, look, if you take this, you've got ten years. And he said, well, what happens if I don't take it? And they said, well, you've got two years. And he said, well. I want two years of high quality life, doing what I'm doing, not being a vegetable and drug out of my head. I'm going to take the two years. So he took himself off all the medication, and and this guy left school. If even if he went to school, I don't even know if he went to school, but he had no qualifications. But he knew more about nature than any biologist I've ever met. Yeah. He taught me so much. Um, he taught me so much respect about nature. He taught me so much about resilience because the jobs he had me doing were basically there's a huge pile of felled trees there and I want them taking from that side of the track to this side of the track. <laughs> and then it all becomes about, as you know, like say moving weights and things, about efficiency. Yeah. If you pick these things up in the wrong way, you're going to do your back in five minutes or you're going to be tired out or the, the logs are cold, they've got ice on them, so you've got to wear gloves. And, and I normally don't wear gloves for this sort of thing. There's just no wear gloves. No, I don't need gloves. I don't need gloves. I know what I'm doing. Within 10 minutes, I couldn't feel my hands, uh -huh. so I put the gloves on. But then I was in agony. <laughs> and it's like, this is the way you hold the log. And this is the way you move with the log. And if you do this all day, then it's, it, becomes, it becomes easy. So anyway, after a few years, um, um, I lost contact with Dave, and I rented my own woodland. And I did this for a job, day in, day out. Now, I had the woodland to teach my courses, but it was also there as a way of making money while I was setting up the company. I had all this standing dead wood, which was firewood, which I could sell. So I had to fell the trees, saw the logs, chop the logs, put them into a trailer, drive the trailer to a place, unload at a person's house, drive back all day, every day. It was the ultimate movement and kind of workout type of, type of stuff. And I absolutely... Loved, even though it was so so physically demanding at times, you just couldn't move. Being in the woods all day, every day, just dirty, muddy, uh, dog tired. Like I get home from the office, for example, 
and my body would be totally awake, but my mind would be exhausted from typing all day on the computer. Yeah. Now I was getting home with my mind was really razor focused and like alert. My body was dog tired, and I loved the difference. It was yeah. it was natural. I don't know if that's right, but yeah. to me it felt natural. Yeah, I can um, I can completely relate to that. I, I do. Um, you know, Neil, you're my hero, man. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely beautiful story. Wow, that's yeah, um, that's very inspiring. That's uh, uh, that's absolutely. Uh, you know, there's there's a certain amount of guilt that I carry um, being in the gym business, um, and, and I don't know whether it's you know my just the indirect influence of my grandfather and and or, or that upbringing that makes me think this way, but there's part of me that's just a little bothered by the amount of work that is done in the gym and I mean work in terms of, of, of physics in terms of you know picking stuff up and, and actually you know work um, that produces absolutely nothing you know there's you know I, I've always joked with the guy that actually owns the building that we should be uh, uh, we should be hooking dynamos up to the cardio machines yes. you know so that we're at least generating a little bit of electricity yeah. um, you know, it, it, it's you know the liability issue is is really crippling. But uh, uh, why not have a wood lot, you know, adjacent to the gym, and you know have yeah. clients come in and split firewood for thirty minutes? You don't think that won't kick their asses? That will yeah. totally wear you out. You know, if you're looking for a hard workout, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I mean, there is a friend of mine who lives about six hours drive from here in the desert. Um, they have this eco place, mm -hmm. and their washing machine is powered by a bike. Yeah. So you get on the bike, and that powers the dynamo that drives the washing machine. And if you don't pedal hard enough, it, everything slows down. And <laughs> you've got to pick it up again and keep going. Um, so that, I mean, I'm not advocating, obviously, because I have a washing machine just up there, and I'm like the rest of us. I'm I don't live in in a in a wiki up in the middle of the forest. I have a house with all the stuff around me. Um, and I, I like to dip into that world. I, I've, I've also dipped into gyms because um, there have been times in my life when I have been really bored, angry, fed up with work, life, relationships, money, you name it. And, and I know for me that going into a gym, I, I've never left gym feeling worse than when, than when I went in. Yeah. I may hurt a lot, but when I come out, I feel good, I feel I've done something, I feel positive, I've achieved something. And 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 I wouldn't even suggest that gyms are only a stepping stone to a something else. They are what they are. And for me, they've been there and they've been very important for me. I didn't particularly 100% relate to the experience, but I know lots of other people, and particularly some endurance athletes, that's where they train. They can't train with a rock because they'd end up injured. You know, they yeah. need... A control bar and I ran it would put me right about all this stuff you know I don't know what I'm talking about with the technicality <laughs> of it all but um, 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 they have their place and I think it's a really important place it's a much better place than this couch anyway well I think yes absolutely agreed with that and I think there is you know we are in a uh, a unique position in that we can choose you know yeah. that we are in yeah. a place where we can, you know, dip and 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 find, you know, what our own personal, you know, mix is. I mean, I know that there are plenty of people out there who think that, you know, that I'm absolutely crazy that I spend, <laughs> you know, the amount of time that I do <laughs> splitting firewood um, because they just don't see the visceral pleasure that I get from it, and that's cool. That's fine. I, yeah. you know. If if everybody was burning wood burning stoves, you know, I'd have trouble finding trees. At, you know, <laughs> as it is, they're very easy for me to come by. So uh, yeah. uh, I'm perfectly yeah. happy with that. Um, you know, every once in a while, uh, we'll do an outing at the gym, and I'll I'll do a man hands day, and and you know, I'll have clients come out, and we will split firewood. You know, here at my house yeah. or or at the lot that I've got next door. Um, and so uh, uh, so we do we get to to dip in and out. Um, so, 
that's that's really cool. Yeah, um, I mean the the only downside with this log splitting because I was a kind of professional log splitter, you know, that's sp spend four years at university to beat the hell out of wood, and that's what I was doing, <laughs> you know. And it's it's just doing that though is massively unbalanced. I, I had another big job in my wood once where. I had to hand split 28,000 roof shingles out of chestnut. Um, and it was five months of my life doing nothing but splitting shingles. And you talked about your axe. And I had an axe, beautiful handmade axe by a company called Grand Stores. And I had to finish the sides and things with the axe, split it with this old tool that Dave called me, told me he was a fro, he's the old woodsman. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I was doing it all in this traditional way. Everything was hand split, but everything was my right arm. And at the end of five months, I couldn't roll my sleeve up on the right hand, my, my arm. The arm was just ludicrously big. Um, <laughs> and goodness knows what damage I've been doing to myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are advantages too. But um, you, have to, you have to switch. You have to learn how to, uh, uh, you know, to, and that's one of the things that, that I try to promote is, 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 you know, for every swing that I throw with the right, I'm going to swing with the left. Now, certainly with with more detailed work with uh, uh, you know with splitting shingles with a fro, I can totally see that you know if if you're you know not as dexterous in your left side that there's 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 waste in terms of you know trying to get that side up to speed. But uh, um, <laughs> I was more worried about my hand actually. <laughs> So yeah. Starting to experiment with a left-hand axe, and you know, yeah, yeah. No, I know how clumsy I am with my right hand. With my left hand, it would have been a it would have been a short job. I have been blessed. I have all my fingers and toes, so uh, yeah. I've done well in that regard. You know, I hope to keep that. <laughs> yes. No. I'm. I think I'm more intact through pure luck and someone looking over me than any intention of it because I've been close so many times I really have yeah I I don't know whether it's uh, uh, it probably is entirely uh, a Pollyanna view on my part but uh, uh, I think that there is that joy is a protective charm uh, in in some ways that you know if you know, if you take absolute joy in what you do, you're just less likely to get hurt. Yeah. Um, you know, I have no proof behind that. There's absolutely no scientific basis behind that whatsoever. Uh, but it's just, you know, in my experience and in my belief, there's something about really enjoying what you do. Yeah, and I think if you're really enjoying what you're doing, you tend to be more focused on what you're doing. If you hate what you're doing, you're zoning out into yes. daydreaming, whatever, angry with it. Um, I know that if I'm, for example, if I'm really angry about something, I am actually unbalanced in what I do. I, I tend to be, I drop things and I get angry. I trip over things. I'm not, I, I really am not on it at all. And you know, like the sportsmen, when they talk about being in the zone, when they when the, when the tennis ball is this big and it's slowed down and they and when you're actually loving something you have got that attention you you've got the axe you're swinging that axe there's an ease to it you know these athletes that are, are, are training in gym there's an ease to the way that they're moving at watching a gymnast there's, there's something incredible about the way that they're flowing that they're so focused they're so loving what they're doing that just you they just know how to move their bodies you know it's just it's a joy to behold when you see someone passionately loving what they're doing. I just stop down. It doesn't matter what that thing is, making a cake, making a table. I can just sit and watch them. It's a joy, absolute pleasure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so to segue from there, how, uh, as a listener or um, as myself, how would I get connected with Earth Strength if I'm interested in coming out for one of your workshops? How do I find you guys? How does that go about? Well, we're um, website is is the best and easiest way where we just earthstrength.com takes you to our website um, and on there is all the stuff about our courses and what we do, when we do, how we do, where we do it, and things like that. Um, basically, we, we run our own courses, our own Earth Strength courses throughout the year, um, 
And starting in February, we're going to run at least one every single month. And we're also partnering with people, some incredible people, um, like people like Steve Atlas, um, people like Brendan Cosso, uh, people like hopefully Mark Davis, Matt Whitmore in the UK, um, people absolutely at the top of their tree, doing things with that passion, that love, that 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 joy, all in the all in the fields of movement, fitness, in in terms of Matt and Keris, they have a wonderful book called Fitter Foods, which. I think it's called Primal Something in the United States. It's all mm -hmm. about a sort of paleo diet. Uh, yeah. it, it's not. It's more than that. But it's just a wonderful book. Um, and and their fitness, uh, their, their, their personal trainers as well. And they combine diet and movement and fitness. And so hopefully we'll be working with the, those guys in the new year. If not this year, then next year. Um, so there's the partner courses and there's 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 our four. Earth strength courses as well. Wonderful, very cool. All right, I'm definitely. Uh, uh, we will link to that with uh, uh, with the the publication. Hey, dogs are barking at cats outside. Sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, but we will link to this for, with the publication of this interview on our website, and uh, uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, we get this uh, uh, promoted. Um, Rannick said something about. Uh, um, are you guys coming to the states? Was yeah, I... well, yeah, yeah. We're, we're planning. Um, I mean, there's. We've been invited to a number of places. Um, to to Egypt to to go to um, LAX gym with uh, Nirvana Zahia on the Red Sea. Um, oh wow. We have um, so we we made some incredible contacts, um, and this is the you know, this is the wonderful thing about the internet that you we are so connected, yeah. and we've met people like yourself, for example, which we could never have met in any other way than, than the internet. And um, there are people um, like Brandon and Nikki who are into sort of maniac fitness, primal fitness over in in Maine, um, and we're talking about possibly doing something with them. We have some ideas, possibly going to Santa Barbara as well, um, um, potentially doing some stuff with this wonderful yoga community in Virginia, because um, they love this whole nature thing. Um, yeah. So maybe we'll go and do something there, but we're certainly going to come to the United States, maybe South Africa, certainly Egypt, Europe. We're going to take it to Great Britain as well from Spain. So we're kind of on tour, if you like. That's, That's on tour next awesome. Year. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very cool. Uh, you'll have to keep me posted on that. Uh, um, definitely, uh, we'll promote that through Mental Meatheads, and uh, that's great. Uh, if uh, um, if I can arrange to uh, uh, find a way to meet you on one of your stops, I'll definitely come through because that, it would uh, be a pleasure uh, to see you. It really would. Really, yeah, I would look forward to that. Um, well, Neil, I have have taken up a little over an hour of your time. An hour. Uh, I, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate uh, uh, you taking the time to talk with me today. Uh, um, I, you know, I think I certainly could continue to talk to you for an hour more. I know. So uh, For sure. Uh, it's been a real two-way. I've, I've absolutely loved it. I'm really, really, really good talking to you. Absolutely. Uh, we'll have to have you back on again because uh, uh, your your work is fascinating to me. I'm I'm very excited to know that uh, uh, that this is being done and uh, uh, it's inspiring to me in my own work. So uh, uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, uh, that you're out there doing this. Um, no, no, thank you, Dave. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, everybody, this has been Neil Hill uh, with EarthStrength.com. Uh, Really appreciate you taking the time to check out our interview. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to our uh, um, our channel here on YouTube. And uh, uh, all you people at Google, do me a favor. Leave it alone for a while. <laughs> let, let me get this thing figured out before you start changing it again. Um, and everybody else, have a wonderful, wonderful week. And I'll talk to you next time. Take care. <laughs>